Well, what I'd love to talk about, I mean, um, the future of cities. How do you see the forces that will shape the city of the future? But if architecture is about improving the quality of life, then surely this is right at the heart of, of architecture. But how do we effect that revolution, that transformation? Could I kind of launch straight in? You've been teaching economics at Harvard for almost 30 years. You're the author of numerous and very influential books on the city. Um, you, your research uh, shows that high density cities have a lower carbon footprint than um, suburban or rural communities. Um, but you also make the point that the environmental impact of sprawl may be mitigated eventually by technological change. Could you talk a little about that? Um, certainly. Uh, the one number that I'd like to keep in mind is that if India and China see their per capita carbon emissions rise to that scene in the sprawling United States, global carbon emissions go up by 94%. If they level off at the Hong Kong carbon emission level, uh, which is much lower, uh, global carbon emissions go up by less than 10%, right? So there's an enormous difference between a sprawling carbon intensive economy like the United States and one that is hyper dense like Hong Kong. Now, in a world in which the primary sources of carbon emissions, transportation, uh, home heating, home cooling, have become much less carbon intensive, right? In a world in which we can move around with uh, purely electric cars that are somehow or other fed entirely by solar energy, perhaps that will fall. Uh, but uh, I think in the medium run, at least, we want to make sure that India and China follow as closely as possible to the view of a, a denser, more compact uh, path rather than the, a path that hopes that technological change will keep, will catch up with the downsides of sprawl. So, how do you see patterns of mobility? Do you see electrification as inevitable, uh, given that really to achieve that, presumably the energy that's needed is going to be uh, essentially fossil fuel based because 80% of that is fossil fuel based, as opposed to say, um, keeping the infrastructure and using the technology of carbon free fuels, or even, uh, for example, if you convert seawater uh, to kerosene or jet fuel, it's actually carbon restorative in the sense that it's taking carbon out of the out of the oceans. So what you're really saying is, you know, these trends are linked to trends in transportation. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on that? Uh, absolutely. And I think one of the, the things that's um, related to what you were just talking is the extent to which transportation investments today can bind us in with technologies yeah. over the next 100 years, right? So, you know, the extent to which the tube is reflecting investments done in the late 19th century and in a sense, you know, 19th century technologies, I worry a lot that the investments that we make today will bind us in, no matter what marvels are created over the next 50 to 100 years, um, it may be very difficult to take advantage of them uh, unless we actually have a, an approach to transportation technology that is sufficiently flexible to enable our, our adjustment. Um, so, could you, could you talk about, about the trends? Um, in other words, how do you see the city in the future? Is it a, a manifestation of trends that are already apparent? So, I think the biggest question on everyone's mind right now, at least that I, I you know, when I, I interact is to what extent is this pandemic some sort of a game changer? To what extent is the work from home thing something, something new that's going to really change things? Now, when I think about the 40 year trend 
the 50-year trend. I go back, let's say, to Alvin Toffer, who wrote The Third Wave in 1980 and really imagined a world in which work from home would make face-to-face -face contact in the cities that enable that contact utterly obsolete. And for 40 years, he was completely and totally wrong. Right? For 40 years, new technology wasn't spreading everyone out. It was bringing people together, housed in innovative uh, offices. I, I think of your own you know, path-breaking Willis building, where you broke down barriers between workers. Far from dispersing them, we were bringing them together, right? because that's how human creativity works. And uh, the trend was not for dispersal and just looking at screens. The trend was for common humanity to connect with one another, to enjoy all the spontaneous events that can happen in, a, in an urban space. And then all of a sudden, we were banished from each other. All of a sudden, we had to de-urbanize our world because of fear of pandemic. And we figured out how to sort of make things work on Zoom and, and WebEx and the other technologies. And in some occupations, many of the st studies have been on call center work. Uh, the productivity loss wasn't terrible. But for many of us, even if we were able to teach or advise or write or design buildings via Zoom, the joy was gone. And I think even more importantly, our ability to train young talent was rapidly diminished, right? Even though software programmers, Microsoft tells us, are as productive at home as they were before, overall new hires for software programmers for the industry as a whole were down 42% in November of 2020 as opposed to February of 2020. Firms stopped hiring new workers because they couldn't inculcate them within the spirit of the firm. They couldn't connect them. They couldn't bring them together. So at least as I think about the next 20 to 30 years, I do think individual cities are more vulnerable than ever. I do think that cities that mistreat their workers, that mistreat their talent, right, could well face an exodus, particularly within open systems like the United States, where it's pretty easy to leave, um, you know, Boston or Philadelphia or New York if you want to these days. And Zoom has made that easier. But I think the long run trend continues to favor human connection. It continues to favor density. It continues to fa favor urban areas that are high, that are spacious, uh, that are you know, less asking less of the environment. I mean, it's really making the point, your point about cities is that it's the essence of proximity. And really, I think in the long term, the workplace is a social gathering place and perhaps um, it's it's much more a community center uh, in, in you know socially yes. yes and not just you know high end i mean there's a wonderful book by my former colleague Catherine newman called no shame in my game that talks about the workers in an urban hamburger chain right not exactly what you think of as being the high creative class connecting but they are having a great deal. This is their social connection. This is their community. They're connecting with each other. They're joking with each other. They're playing with each other. They're taking care of each other, even as they work for, uh, you know, relatively low wages. And I think for everyone who has experienced the pain of a year in quarantine, right, I think everyone should be keenly aware of how important real human contact is and the number of people who are clearly aching to get out there uh, again, I think only further reinforces the point that Buildings are not just spaces for work, they're spaces for community. Do you think that the pandemic will lead to a kind of reassessment in terms of equality in the in the city um, as maybe real estate values uh, level out? Um, you have the syndrome in so many cities that those who actually make the city run uh, are not able, can, cannot afford to be uh, where the action is, uh, they're banished to the uh, to the outer rims of the city for economic reasons. I hope so, uh, and I hope it's done. I hope the new leveling is done in a way that is smart rather than destructive, and a way that levels up rather than simply tries to cut off the tall poppies. Um, the the pandemic has been wildly unequal. Um, we have death data now by income. And it, it is amazing though, and even education, the work by my colleague Raj Chetty uh, has found that mortality rates for the best educated Americans barely went up in 2020 overall. It's not saying that no one died from COVID, but the reduction, the reduction in other forms of mortality more or less offset that among the well-educated. Among the poorly educated, it was a tip, it was a completely different story. 
partially because the younger ones were going to work out of necessity. The older ones, though, also died, perhaps because they were brought into contact with the younger ones when they came home uh, from work. Um, a fact that's related to this is in May 2020, 68.9% of Americans with advanced degrees were, telecom were teleworking, were commuting via uh, their computer. Only 5% of American high school dropouts were telecommuting in the same month, right? Wildly unequal, this pandemic. And it's really important uh, that I think we confront urban inequities. One part of this is the cost of housing. The second, which is upward mobility in cities, which is particularly problematic in the US. That in fact, cities are fantastic places for adults to, to you know, to, to thrive in very difficult places for children to succeed in, which I find amazing given that I was an urban kid myself, but clearly I was very fortunate. Um, in terms of affordability, uh, there is no answer that is better than just building. And we need to have a priority, which uh, which is not necessarily government subsidized affordable housing, but we need to make it easier for creative architects to build high density, middle income residential buildings that are closer to the city center. We need to make that somehow rather possible. In terms of the, the kids in the US, it's about schools, it's about vocational programs, but I think it's also about mixing. One of the things that the cell phone data really shows is that for adults, adults, even if they live far out, Right? They come in and they mix with a whole you know, seg segment of the city. They mix with well-educated, they mix with rich, they go to jobs which are connected to other people. Poor children grow up in segregated housing projects and go to segregated schools. And for them, a city becomes an isolated village. And in some sense, both figuring out how to fix the schools piece, but also figuring out ways so that the housing of poor children is more integrated into the flow of the city feels absolutely central. And the beauty of those things are they can be done without frightening off the rich. They can be done without tearing down urban businesses. Uh, they can be done in a way that makes life better for everyone. This brings us back in a way to the political domain. The point was made to me by a friend that as he saw it up to the 1930s, infrastructure in the United States was essentially privately driven. It was only in the 30s that it became a government issue. Um, so how do you see the future in terms of the balance between the private and public? Um, if, so if you're defining infrastructure in its most classic you know, way, which is uh, transportation related fixed infrastructure. So it, the word comes into English from French and, and originally obviously from Latin where it's used originally for rails. That statement is entirely true. Uh, that in fact, the, the rails and the transportation uh, technologies by and large were built in the, in the 19th century for, um, by private companies with, with public subsidy, of course. Uh, the Intercontinental Rail was massively subsidized by land grants. If you're talking about, in some sense, the most important form of urban infrastructure, which is water and sewer, um, a lot of that was was public. By the late 19th century, that was dominant public. Um, and in some sense, it was the great task of city governments in the 19th century in the US. America's city governments were spending as much on water and sewerage in 1900 as our national government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army, right? In the UK, uh, water and sewer was slightly more of a national undertaking. There's a marvelous speech by Disraeli in the Houses of Parliament about, you know, the, the great stink that the Thames had become and, you know, redoubling the national effort towards cleansing, cleansing the Thames. Um, but I think the, the 21st century equivalent is both thinking about the infrastructure that is relevant for fighting disease and thinking about the infrastructure that was related to climate change, both of which require both a national and a global commitment. So there's no way that the private sector is going to fix any of those things, and it has to be done with a, a smart national commitment on those things. I mean, coming back to your earlier reference to China, Hong Kong, uh, do you see the emerging cities, the urbanities, which still remain to be built at a staggering uh, scale, uh, learning from some of the lessons of the West um, in terms of pedestrianization, uh, attitudes to the private car, public transport. How do you see those those trends in terms of emerging economies and more static Western ones? Uh, I think that your, your question hints at uh, this basic fact that our cities in the West are very static. 
And the big action in urban change over the next 50 years will be in South Asia, East Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Latin America will be in the developing world cities. And it is absolutely vital that uh, we do our best to have them learn from the West, not in the sense that we are great, you know, uh, Western teachers who know the right answers, but we certainly know many of the biggest mistakes. We certainly have made many of the biggest mistakes, and we can at least illustrate uh, illustrate those mistakes. Um, one of those mistakes certainly is uh, artificial subsidization of the car and uh, strongly favoring, strongly uh, supporting suburbanization in the U.S., um, making it too difficult to walk around traditional cities, making it too difficult to build up. I mean, I, I, I'm not all that much of a fan of the British Town and Country Planning Act as applied to uh, Oxfordshire, but applying the same basics of the act to Mumbai is madness, right? Uh, and, you know, just embracing the sort of low-density city beautiful model for a, a great Asian city, which really needs to build towers that are close to one another, that enable people to connect with one another, uh, is just absolutely vital. So I think fighting for proximity, fighting for street space, particularly in India, seems like one of the great challenges ahead. And do you see some of the shifts in, uh, in patterns of mobility freeing up more space in cities to make them essentially greener and more pedestrian friendly? I think that is likely to remain in the wealthy West. So I think many cities have removed cars in the wake of the pandemic to allow more street space for eating, for restaurants. And, and um, that's a great trend. And I, I hope that that will continue, that will persist post pandemic. Many cities have, have already declared that it will. Uh, so in some sense, that's reclaiming a bit of space from the car. I hope that that will become uh, more natural in the developing world as well. We have yet to see. It's less, uh, it's more difficult in many cases to enforce laws. And so it's harder to move the the shape of the, of the city. But I think there will probably be some victories in this. China is probably the easiest place to see this move, would be my guess. That in fact, uh, China is uh, very attuned to what happens in the West has a strong ability to enforce the rule of law, um, whereas it'll be harder in, in India and Africa. Um, if this was a, uh, a platform to get important messages across to a wider audience and those who make decisions, uh, what, what, what words would you, uh, would you use to address that opportunity? I would try and get two things across, one of which is I know of no pathways out of prosperity. Out of, I know of no pathways out of poverty into prosperity that do not run through city streets. And when we are thinking about the cities of the developing world, it is so natural to look at their messiness and say, "Why can't we just make it stop? Why can't we just stop poor people from coming? Make them go somewhere else invisible where we don't need to see them." But even in a slum, even in a favela, there is hope. There is the possibility. And so we really have to embrace the notion that city building is one of the great vocations of the 21st century. Fighting to make those cities more livable rather than restricting their size, restricting their growth is the right course ahead. And if I were 23 and had any interest in this topic, I think I cannot think of a better life than trying to make places like Mumbai or Lusaka or Cape Town or Sao Paulo places with more beauty, more hope, more opportunity. Um, that would be the message that I would always try and get across. You, you finally, you talk about the travelers, the 14% of humanity who don't have clean water, power, modern sanitation. Um, do you see the potential to use technology to transform those settlements from within rather than the uh, social issues that follow from bulldozing, because, uh, as you say, they're communities of hope and not despair. I think this is right. I mean, as in most cases, there exist two technological paths forward for solving the problem of housing in favelas, just as there exist two paths for transportation, right? Jitneys, small minibuses, which is the, you know, 
the, the traditional way versus building a, a shiny train, right? Um, I think in the case of minibuses, the right right cap course is instead of sinking billions on, an, on a rail system, most of the time, the right answer is to try and improve those buses over years to try and embed them into a, a system which is connected, which is safer, um, which Istanbul basically did over the past 40 years. In the case of housing, uh, you know, we don't have to bulldoze and replace with tall concrete towers. We can do modular stuff. We can do small things that are, you know, I, I've seen amazing things in plastics in Latin American construction where, you know, you build a couple of floors on the other. Uh, it can be organic. It can be self-created. It can be empowering rather than, than you know, disempowering. And I think that's what we all hope for is a world in which people come to cities and grab in those cities the, the opportunity to make their own future. I think that's a great and optimistic note to end on. Thank you so much. Thank you. This was lovely.